Herman Godinez. I'm one of the emergency medicine physicians. I'm also a member of the Physician Education Committee. And uh, welcome everyone. Dr. Isaacson is your residence. Welcome, welcome. And then I'd like to welcome Dr. Sandy Rock. He's the risk communicator for HPMC, Occupational Medicine Services at uh, Hanford Nuclear Site. He's going to talk to us today about the health hazards and risk for Hanford cleanup. Has actually worked in some interesting places. Graduated uh, from the University of Virginia in 1970, just a few days ago. I'm not trying to age you too much. <laughs> I was going to ask you not to say the date. <laughs> General Medicine Pediatrics in San Diego and Virginia. Worked in Washington. Also received his Master of Public Health, interestingly enough, in Tulane, which is where he had Katrina Arena and some of the different hurricanes and some of the damage from that. So a lot of uh, different and interesting experiences as well. Active member of the uh, American Public Health Association, Washington State Public Health, taught some environmental cell biology and environmental health from 2000, 2005 at Bellevue College, and has served on multiple boards. Interestingly enough, I, I serve and help out on the emergency operations planning, and that's part of what he does as well as disaster response and planning committee in San Diego State, which California, the West Coast, and some of the places have been, have been hotbeds of natural disasters, some environmental issues, and also some things as far as chem bioterrorism. So I think he's kind of uniquely in a position to guide us a little bit more, give us a great lecture. And without further ado, looking forward to an interesting hour of discussion. Thank you so much. And I've been told I can, <clears throat> I've been told I can give, I can talk a little bit longer than an hour or two, which is always a dangerous thing to tell me. Uh, so yeah, and I was on the tsunami committee, uh, which probably doesn't apply a whole lot here, unless a uh, dam breaks or something. But uh, that was at San Diego State. And then I did, I was just uh, telling him that I went back down to New Orleans in uh, 07 and did a Habitat for Humanity Saturday uh, right before our occupational medical uh, meeting that I was going to. And that was fascinating because it was in the same area, the Ninth Ward, where I had run a clinic in 1972. So there I was back. And the people just seemed like the same people to me, but it was another generation. Anyhow, uh, I am who I am. And we can start running through the slides. <laughs> so. Um, I don't have any relevant financial relationships with any commercial interests that have anything to do with my presentation today. And the views that I'm expressing, including the one I just expressed, uh, don't necessarily represent those of the HBMC Occupational Medical Services or the Department of Energy. Nevertheless, that's where I work. So I'm assuming a few things, and I'm sorry I didn't make this bigger, that you know where the Hanford site is and what it is and why it is and when it arose from the vast, as I say, shrub step of the south central part of Washington State, which I think is a fascinating story. And on the right side there, I have, whoops, I to push that button. Uh, Michelle Gerber, a friend of mine, and she's still sort of the historian out there, wrote on the home front. How many of you have been on the site, by the way? Taken a tour or been out there some other way? Hunting elk or, okay, <laughs> fishing. Uh, uh, but that's a terrific book, and she, she changes it every few years, so I, don't, I think it's in the fifth edition or something. And then uh, Roy Gephardt also has a terrific book, a conversation about nuclear waste and cleanup, and he's got a couple of follow-ups on that, too. So if you want to know what's going on out there, that's probably the best way to do it. Um, of course, we, Hanford's been in the news a lot, especially in the last year or two, and present-day mission is, of course, cleanup. It has been since late 1980s, 87, 88, somewhere in there when Hazel O'Leary released all the documents that uh, revealed what had happened at Hanford and, and some of the things that uh, people knew about and a lot that people didn't know about. So that become revel became revelatory and um, that's about the same time the cleanup started. Right now we take care of about 8,500 workers uh, that are doing the cleanup work out there. That's we meaning Hanford, I mean, excuse me, HPMC, Occupational Medical Services. This is the third contract that I've worked under at the, uh, for the Occupational Medical uh, contract uh, since 2004 when I came here. So, By the way, if you want to ask questions, uh, too bad. If you want to ask questions, if it's a quick question that has something re with relevancy to what I'm talking about that time, I'll try to answer it. If it's something that's a little off track, which I tend to get, um, then we'll wait till the end. I usually have somebody in the front row be a digressometer, and if I get more than two standard deviations away from what I was supposed to be talking about, just sort of stick your hand up or, or whatever you want to do. Okay, so I thought I'd start with a little, I, I do risk communication training at the site, and we've trained more than a thousand uh, PICs, planners, supervisors, PIC, you know what a PIC is, by the way, PIC? Person in charge, another, another TLA from the Hanford site, three-letter abbreviation, so TLA is a TLA. 
And uh, we've trained them in risk uh, communication over the last uh, four or five years because, first of all, I thought they needed it. Secondly, uh, the Brilliant Corrective Action Plan, which I'll talk about later, had a line in it, has a line in it, that says that um, issues will be discussed using a, a standardized risk communication principles or following those principles. So that became the uh, impetus for this course to be developed. So I thought I'd start by talking about what, you know, what a hazard is, what a risk is, what risk perception is, and how do we modify, uh, reduce those risks. And I just mentioned the risk communication training. So anybody, what's, what's a hazard? Three words, or four words maybe. Real easy, what's a hazard? Something that can? Don't get fancy, hurt you, yes, thank you. Something that can hurt you. So if that's a hazard, what's a risk? We talk about taking risks, or there are lots of risks out there, but what do we really mean by that? A risk is a potential, chance, probability, any of those. So we have hazards, we have risks. So we try to reduce risk, I meaning we try to reduce the likelihood of somebody being harmed by the hazards that are out there. Risk perception is your personal viewpoint of what is risky, what a hazard is, and how likely you are to get harmed by it, uh, and then also what the consequence might be, how severe the consequence might be. So why is this important? Because we have, as I said, we're taking care of 8,500 workers, and you can bet that they have 8,500 different perceptions of the risks out there. And so you can see what the challenge is and why, uh, why we work on this and why we do the risk communication training. So how do we modify or reduce the risk? We do that by simply creating rules, putting up fences, getting rid of the hazard, all those things. There's a whole litany of things. So we talk out, out there about administrative controls, which are rules and regs, engineering controls, which are fences and signs and so forth, and then PPE. Everybody knows PPE, I think, personal protective equipment. So masks and gloves and gowns and hoods and so forth. So here are the answers to those questions. Something that can hurt you, probability, chance, likelihood, odds. And you know, if that light were to fall out of the ceiling right there and the two ladies in the back, uh, their risk uh, would be pretty high for getting injured. Whereas these chance over here, their risk would be very low. So how do you reduce their risk? We either fix the light or you have them move to a different seat and reduce their risk. So we're doing that all the time out there. Um, so personal view of probability and, and the severity of the consequences of a hazard and then risk management is what I was just discussing. That's, that's what it is in its simplest form. So in our risk communication training we have these uh, posters that we put, put up on the wall and we ask people to put their magnets where they see themselves probability of harm occurring and you'll see the different uh, choices in a second and I will hand out handouts in a few minutes and then the severity of harm or the consequence on this axis. So a simple graph. So here's uh, commuting to work. This is a fairly typical linear curve, if you would, that you get when you have a population who have different attitudes about different subjects, in this case commuting to work. Uh, and of course where you are on that line may change. If you have a wreck one week, you may put your magnet, these are magnets that we stick up on the wall, you may put your magnet somewhere else after that. You might see it as more likely and more devastating, depending how, how uh, harmed you were during that. So, but this is sort of a typical thing. Then we have these outliers. It would be interesting to talk to each one of those folks, but we don't do that in the training, to find out why they are where they are. And then this one is having a handgun in the home. And there's always some person that says, well, if somebody brings the handgun in because they're invading you, I, I guess it's pretty high. I said, no, this is about having guns in your house. What, you know, how do you perceive the risk? So here's an interesting cluster. People think it's pretty unlikely that it's going to happen, but if it does happen, if something does happen, a kid gets a hold of the gun or somebody leaves the gun lock off or the gun cabinet's open and there are little kids around the house, then the results can be devastating. So low risk, but high consequence. And then who are these people? I don't know. That might have been one of the magnets that we use to hold the board on there. Because <laughs> I have made that mistake before. Uh, Next one, traveling in a plane. And we leave it just like that, traveling in a plane. Don't say if it's your own personal plane, if you're a pilot, if you're on a commercial plane, if it's a 787, uh, if there's some suspicious looking characters on board, we just leave it up to them. So again, what's the risk? Well, how do pre people perceive the risk? What's the risk? What do they, how do they perceive it, low or high? Okay, low, and what's the consequence? Uh, yeah, you don't pull off the side of the, of the road and change your broken wing. So. Pretty high risk. 
so here's working around radiation, and I do specify we're talking about ionizing radiation, not just any radiation, because light and heat and sound, all those are radiation too, but EMR. Uh, working around rad, kind of interesting because usually the cluster is more down here. This particular class, I guess, just was a little more concerned about the possible, and who knows, it might have been, we have so many different varieties of people that come through this training, I don't know who these were that I took the pictures of, but you know, oops, low risk for, for the most part, some people think high risk, and, but a variety of responses to the uh, consequence of exposure. So it really depends a lot on your worldview and who knows who this group of people was at that time. If I took this uh, poster over to Seattle and asked the group of people to put their magnets up, where would the magnets be? Yeah, probably top right, probably up there somewhere. Yeah. Okay, so here's just some of the uh, Hanford specific and non-specific hazards and health concerns out there on the site. I'm not going to talk about all those or we'd be here all afternoon. We may be anyway with the ones I am going to cover. Uh, you can look at the list and I'm going to hand this out right now because I want to play that game with the graph first. She said put it right here, but it looks like you're up and ready. So thank you. So the ones I am going to discuss are in red and they're sort of bolded on your handout <laughs> and you have all these slides on there. Um, you know, this, this day and age when we're electronically oriented, when you have handouts and paper, you can't click on the URLs, the links, and uh, you can't use the fancy little, there's uh, something I'm going to hand out a while later, you just take your scanner and it takes you right to the, all the information you want to know about radiation. But this, I'm going to allude to or discuss or at least mention en passant uh, most of these things that I haven't read. So again, bold it in your handout so you can look at those. I'm going to have to put my cheaters on here. So a few words about physical ha hazards. Uh, we got, and Mark Grimmett, who's in the back, one of our PAs, and by the way, my medical director is sitting back there, uh, Dr. Karen Phillips, and the clinical director, doc, Dr. Denise, All Denise Allgood, is back there. And uh, tell me if you agree or disagree with, with this, but most of the things that we see or the, the providers see are strains and sprains and contusions and maybe cuts and bruises and so forth with a variety of other things too, but back sprain, what else, ladies and gentlemen, back there? But most of it is that kind of injury. Uh, generally not major, but sometimes yes, and some of you may well have taken care of some of the people that were injured majorly out there. Trips and falls, and sometimes those trips and falls are the unintended consequence of the gear and or engineering controls. Think, you know, tripping over a fence, tri tripping over a hose or a line or something, or these days at the tank farms where they're all going to be in SCBAs, self-contained breathing apparatus, those things are bulky and heavy and they catch on things and you know you can whack your uh, person that you're working with. Uh, so, so that's an unintended consequence of the things that we're using to protect them from something else. And then uh, I'm not going to spend much more time on that but I wanted to point that out because it is important to note. And let's not forget noise. I literally, my wife is an environmental, senior environmental analyst for the city of Seattle, SPU, Sub Seattle Public Utility. And we'll be driving down the street when we for, we've been together 20 years and when we first were living in Seattle, we were driving around and, and she would spot people without their hard hats on or without their hearing, and we would stop. She would make me stop the car and she'd get out and talk to them. I mean, city workers, not just anybody. But I just, I just, <laughs> I walked by somebody the other day that was doing yard work in my neighborhood at Issaquah Highlands and um, the boss, I could tell he was the, the jefe, jefe, you know, he had his hearing, but the guy that he was telling do this, do that, didn't have any hearing protection. And so I said, hey, and he had to turn his power tool off to so hear me. And I said, that guy doesn't have any hearing protection. And the guy's like, oh, I know. And I said, you know, Ellen and I be on your case for that. He went right over and got his little things out for this guy, you know. But it's true, I mean, you, you don't realize how devastating hearing loss can be until you get to that point in your life where you start having some hearing loss, just the high frequency stuff. So you need to protect your ears all the time, and I, we drill that into the workers, and of course there's a uh, hearing conservation uh, program, one of the many programs that we have at HPMC OMS to protect the workers from that. But it's hard to get, I work with coal miners, it's hard to get them to use the stuff they need to use to protect their health. When I, I was 10 years in Southwest Virginia, and just to get these guys who are a mile back and 500 feet down or farther to keep their mask on, because it was hot, sweaty, difficult work and they pull these things down, they wouldn't be breathing through them like they were supposed to through the respirator. So trying to get them to do that is a challenge. 
motor vehicle accidents, uh, those happen. If you get out there on, on the Hanford site, you see how fast people do drive, coming home from work especially. And then what, why do I have other workers on there? Because sometimes they can be a hazard. I remember one situation where somebody left a uh, floor, I don't even know what you call it, floor door open in, uh, around WTP, I think it was, the waste treatment plant that they're building out there. Another guy was walking along, I think had some papers in his hand, which is not a good thing to do anyway, and fell right through there. And he had numerous fractures, uh, hip fractures, bladder laceration, and so forth and so on. So other workers can be a, a risk to your health too, or they can be a hazard. <coughs> okay, so asbestos we have out there. We have an asbestos program, and people come through. The programs are driven by their EJTA, their employee job task analysis, which tells us electronically now what exposures they might have to what substances or what possible hazards to their health, and that drives the programs that they're in. If they're in a multiple number of programs, we obviously don't do three chest x-rays on somebody because they're in this program, that program, and this. It's, it's all coordinated. So they come in on an annual basis and they get evaluated. So for asbestos, it'd be chest x-ray and pulmonary function testing and so forth. And uh, obviously, we have a, a, asbestos have been, has been known as an occupational hazard for years and years. And so there's a very strong uh, program out there on site with the contractors to keep people from being exposed to it in the first place. But I'll tell you an anecdote about that in a minute, I think. I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, I think it's on a separate slide. Um, and there are all kinds of caustics and corrosives out there. Again, as I said, I'm going to pass by some of these really quickly, but you can imagine the stuff that's left out there from, uh, from the production years. Vapors and fumes I am going to spend more time on. Volatile organic compounds, tank farm vapors, and I just recently finally learned the difference, the difference between a vapor and a fume, because I've always said paint fumes, and I'm wrong, right? But it's paint vapors. Fumes only come from Here's an easy way to remember it, because in French, fumé means to smoke. So fumes only come from heating metals. Right, Karen? That's what a fume is. Yeah. So a vapor is just about anything else that, you know, vaporizes and you can breathe and be exposed to. So it's paint fumes, not, I mean, paint vapors, not paint fumes. So you learn something today. Passing it on. Uh, carbon monoxide, anywhere we have partial combustion of any car carbon uh, material, and then diesel one of the things that I really don't like. But there are a lot of diesel generator, gen generators out there, diesel equipment, diesel machinery, and uh, people are exposed. And one of my friends at DOA is always saying, why did they cite that out there when they're, they know it's upwind from where the people are working? They're downwind from the diesel and they're going to get these fumes. Why didn't they put it over there? Because they could have easily put it over there, whatever the there was or whatever it was. So uh, those things have to be thought about. Uh, and I'll briefly mention lead. Most people know about that. Mercury. Cadmium, beryllium is a big one, and that's why I'm giving this talk, by the way, because I've, I try and I try to get out and offer a, a discussion about beryllium disease, which is lung disease, but people aren't interested in it. They don't really know what it is, and I've given several lectures at various venues here in, the, in this area, the Tri-Cities area, and other places too, but uh, need to talk about beryllium because it's an important thing for those of you that are in patient care to know about because you may have patients that have chronic beryllium disease and know it, or you may have patients that think they have sarcoidosis and actually have chronic beryllium disease because of exposure to beryllium at some point. So we'll be talking about that in a minute too. And then hexavalent chromium, which has an interesting story and uh, some personal anecdotes there too. By the way, the three A's of good communicators, anecdotes, short stories that have some lesson in them, anecdotes, because people remember anecdotes. Analogies, we say, well, we hit that one out of the ballpark, you know, how that job go? We hit it out of the ballpark. Do they really mean? No. They mean we did a great job, so that's an analogy. And then audience, audience awareness, so you know your audience. You can write it down if you want to. Three A's of good communication, good communicators. Anecdote, analogy, audience. Um, so the asbestos, and this is just one situation that happened out there. There was some exposed, another TLA here for you. Anybody not know what ACM is? Come on, admit it. <laughs> asbestos containing material. Okay, so there was some exposed asbestos containing material that was out there in the middle of somewhere and sticking up, just sticking up out there where wind could come along and pick up the asbestos uh, spicules and send them flying and people could inhale it. So there was an investigation. We have lots of investigations out, out there, sometimes internal, meaning among, just within the contractor itself or DOE or external. They'll come from DOE headquarters or somewhere else and evaluate and find out what happened. 
And then after that, and then after that, um, risk management and the risk management there was just sort of lessons learned and people uh, taking care of changing that hazard by, sorry, by uh, uh, removing it or burying it appropriately. So that was the risk management. Now I've got to do two of these because my, oh, that's working. So vapors and fumes, and I'll talk about these independently. So what's the story on the tank farms? Because I think that's why a number of you are here. Uh, this is stuff that you may or may not know. It's all in the press recently. There's 18 farms out there, and they just call them farms because these are flat areas with these million gallon and smaller uh, tanks, circular tanks, underground. You never see the tanks. They're all underground. If you want to see a tank, you can drive up to the hammer facility, and on your right, there's an above ground training tank. It gives you an idea of what these tanks look like. And uh, they're all buried underground. They have all this stuff coming up from them. A lot of it is ventilation. Some of it is for characterization, taking samples and so forth. Breather filters, and you have workers that have to get right up close to personal to those things. Some of the single shell tanks, another PLA for you, SST, uh, are leaking. And at least one, maybe two double shell tanks are leaking between the double shells, not externally into the ground yet. My next door neighbor is a WRPS engineer. Washington River Solutions, Washington River Protective Protection Solutions. Yeah, I get it. And uh, he told me about this one day. He was the one that discovered it because they have a way of monitoring these these tanks and you know leaks and so forth. So he said, "Yeah, there's one between the shells." So now they know they've got some double shell tanks that are leaking too. So not an immediate threat to workers because it's way down under there, and probably not an immediate threat, at least the double shell, not an immediately threatening to the groundwater or the vados. Uh, but eventually, you know, these tanks are leaking, and this is why they're shifting as much as they can, eventually everything, from the single shells to the double shells before the double shell material gets uh, tanked over. I mean, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, moved over you know, through pipes to the, the waste treatment plant, the WTP, the glassification, vitrification plant, WTP, which you see rising up over the horizon out there. It's getting, getting built. And if and when, and then that, that gets sent down to, maybe it's going to stay at Hanford, maybe it's going to get sent down to Nevada. We don't know at this point. So they've characterized the tanks several times since I've been here, recharacterized to see what's in there in the headspace. So you've got the sludge, you've got liquid, most of which has been pumped out, and then you've got the headspace, which is the area above that, up to the top of the tank, which is, again, all underground. Most of them are six, eight, ten feet underground from the top of the tank down uh, from the surface of the ground. And there are at least 1,800 chemicals some of which were produced in the tanks because of the heat, because of the radioactivity from chemicals that were poured there in the first place. Of those, you know, lots of radioactive stuff and, and heat, 59 chemicals of potential concern and how they designate those. I was part of that process back when I first, I think it was 05 or 06, where they looked at the ones that were higher than the occupational, 10% of the occupational exposure limit was, and also were known to have potential health effects. Well. I can't imagine many of these 1800 not having some sort of health effect. So everything probably has a health effect. But here you get a mix of chemicals breaking up either because they want it to or because it just does spontaneously or otherwise transiently emits these fugitive emissions, they call them, just somehow comes out of somewhere. Uh, and people get exposed to those. So that's what, that's what you're reading about in the papers. Workers are out there. They may be working in an area where they don't have to have respiratory protection on. All of a sudden, somebody smells something or they get burning in their mouth or burning in their eyes or a bad taste in their mouth. And they are, they are told immediately if that happens to get upwind from it, report it, make sure other people know not to go there because there's something amiss and they don't want other people being exposed. And that's the extent of the exposure. It's boom. They smell it. They're out of there. So it's seconds to minutes. Uh, and then if, if and when they have symptoms, They'll come see us at one of the clinics, either the Two West Clinic up on site or down where we are in 1979 Snyder, and get evaluated. More on that in a minute. So we've had expert panel comes come in and evaluate the tank farms, and you know, do this, do that. Uh, this is what you do to, should do to protect the worker. Maybe you need to bulk up the uh, medical surveillance program. Maybe you need more PPE, or you need to do whatever they recommend. The most recent one that you've been reading about was from the Savannah River site. The tank vapor assessment team came out here. Uh, they weren't all from Savannah River, but it was basically organized by and run by Savannah River site. And some say that was the hen, you know, uh, what is it, the fox guarding the hen house? Because it's another DOE site. But 
they came out and they evaluated this year, this past year, and one of the things that came out of that where they said, well, these workers are getting exposed to bolus exposures. You don't know how much they're getting exposed to, and you don't know what they're getting exposed to. Why don't they know what they're getting exposed to? Because not everybody is wearing a, you know, a lapel intake for their, that monitors whatever they're breathing. And they have these things that they wear, and they turn those in, and they, they, they can uh, uh, an analyze that and see what they've been exposed to. Well, it's not happening, or it hasn't been happening. So WRPS actually is now infusing lots of bucks, although they're having some budgetary crunch right now, but they're infusing lots of bucks into uh, more monitors, more fancy equipment, more really, really fancy equipment. I go to these meetings every two weeks or twice a month, uh, chemical vapor solution team meeting where they discuss all the stuff that they're doing. So they've got sub teams on that, uh, on that CVST and they're, they're discussing different ways to protect the workers primarily. A lot of it's PPE, a lot of it's monitoring. So all the tank farm workers now are in SCBA, self-contained contained breathing apparatus. All of them, when they go onto a tank farm. Not just the ones that are close to that stuff that burps up, where the breather filters are and the risers are, but everybody. So they're all wearing these tanks. And you can imagine what it's like to be suited up, put a tank on your back, and it's 109 degrees out there, and actually it's usually hotter out there. So heat stress is something that we get asked about every year. One of the things they ask about it from us is, well, how, how can we use heart rate as a, as a measure of heat stress? And it's difficult because everybody has a different heart rate, different things affect heart rate, and you know, we always come back. Every year we go through this, Dr. Phillips will tell you, and we say, you know, you can use it as part of your analysis, but really it's much more important if you can get a, you know, you get a core temperature, that'd be nice, but most of these workers don't like have, having things put up into their core. <laughs> but they do have some fancy stuff. You know, talk about technology, they've got new stuff now that, that you can wear and it transmits and tells you what the temperature is. But more importantly, each worker should know what the symptoms and signs of heat stress are, and they need to work buddy-buddy. So they work two together. Uh, so if one starts acting goofy, the other one recognizes and says, we, we better get you out of here and get you cooled off. And they have, of course, they have the cooling stations and water and fans and shade and all the stuff that they're supposed to have. But uh, this, has been a, this has been a problem. So what are they going to expose to? We don't know. We don't know how much. And the bottom line is, and I'll probably repeat this several times, is that a lot of symptomatic complaints when they come in after these exposures, no physical findings. Maybe some wheezes, a couple of people who either did or didn't have asthma before come in, they have some wheezing aggravated by whatever they breathe in, but otherwise no physical findings. And more, more so, or worse perhaps, no laboratory findings because, oh here's a tank farm, okay. See the fence, see the signs, see the workers, these guys are sort of partially protected, suited up, but not a whole lot. So it's, it's flat, but it has all this equipment. So you can imagine running into those pieces of equipment that are sticking up when you have a SCBA tank on your back. So here's, this is, I took, I took this from a presentation that I give to the workers and, and more importantly to the supervisors, picks planters and supervisors out there, industrial hygienists and uh, uh, safety and health people. And this you all know, I mean that's just, this is what we examine you for, or the providers examine you for. But rarely are there any physical findings, signs versus symptoms from typically transient seconds to minutes, bolus exposures to unknown concentrations of chemical vapors. We don't know what the vapors are. Noted by smell and or effect on the mucous membranes, the eyes, nose, mouth, and throat. Some workers have reported some skin irritation, but no physical findings. And then, here are the lab tests that are typically done after an exposure. CBC, Chem Plus, urinary acetonylmercapturic acid. What's that? It's a metabolite of benzene. And you can, do, you can do urine benzene too, and it turns out it's probably just as good at one point they thought this was better, but now urine benzene is just as good, and I don't know if we're planning on going back to it. But <coughs> and then uh, blood mercury, blood urine, urine mercury, uh, and I'll tell a story about that in a few minutes. Pro time, uh, just to have a base, basis. Uh, usually it's you know it's normal, but unless somebody's on an anticoagulant, uh, because you never know what these chemicals might do, how they might affect the, uh, the coagulation cascade. And then we hold on to the blood for 45 days for whatever reason, you might want to retest it. And then the other laboratory, and depending on a variety of factors, chest x-ray, PFT, sometimes e EKG. When's the last time you did EKG on an exposure person, Mark? You remember doing one? 
I mean, potentially somebody could have an arrhythmia based on you know, inhaling some one of these chemicals, one of these 1,800 chemicals, or a mix of them. Uh, and then referrals to behavioral health services, because a lot of these folks get really freaked out by these exposures, especially when we can't tell them anything. A contractor can't tell them what they got exposed to. We don't know what the concentration might have been. And we can't tell them anything about their health other than, well, we hear what you're saying. You have sore throat, you have metallic taste in your mouth, burning eyes. But that's as far as we can go, sir. If they're wearing a self-contained breathing apparatus, how do they detect the tank breathing? Well, if they're in, and this is why they're on SCBA, so that they don't get exposed to, respiratorily anyway, the tank vapors. But, but prior to that, people weren't wearing SCBA. So they'd be out there like that picture where you saw that people just had hard hats on and a Tyvek suit, but they didn't have uh, respiratory protection. And this is why they've gone to it, because they, okay, until we figure out how to keep these vapors from uh, surrounding workers, and until we know how to monitor better and even predict when these vapors might be popping up out of somewhere, then we're gonna put you all in tanks. So that's what they're, it's basically just like going scuba diving, except you're working and it's hot and it's cumbersome. So again, uh, because a lot of the workers get really concerned about this because there's nothing worse than uncertainty, right? If you can't tell somebody if it's going this way or this way or how, how's your health or you have a disease and nobody can tell you what's, what's going on with it. And beryllium disease is like this, by the way. Uh, then we, uh, we urge them or at least suggest to them that they go to the behavioral health service folks. We have two psychologists and, and they uh, counsel them, at least listen to them. So, Laboratory testing, other than for a few specific set substances like lead, which we don't usually do after exposure because there's not any lead in the tanks, but mercury and the benzene metabolite that I mentioned, there are no specific body tissue tests for any of the chemicals in the tank farm vapors to which workers may have been exposed. If you forget everything else, remember that. We don't have any tests of the workers. I was at a meeting of maybe 80 or 90 workers one day, and the guy said, well, when we, when we come down and we get those blood gases drawn, I went, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't draw blood gases. It's a venous puncture in your vein, and blood gases you take from an artery, and it measures, does anybody know? No, but nobody knows. pH, PO2, PCO2, and I tell him what that means. He said, well, I thought you were testing for those gases we got exposed to. So this, this is the kind of stuff that we have worked on training uh, the workers and the industrial hygienists and the, and the uh, safety and health people, because I heard one of the, one of the supervisors repeat that yeah, when you go down and get your blood gases drawn, I went, no, stop using, forget blood gases. Get off the internet, stop reading things. <clears throat> so for the tests that we do have and for ones that we might add on, we'd like to have more, you know, there's rigorous criteria for valid and useful tests. Look up Wilson and Jungner from 1968 or nine, somewhere in there. And they're the ones that first devised it. All the criteria, is a PSA a good test? Well, no, not for populations as the USPSTF, but for urologists, for somebody with a strong family history or African American or whatever, it might be good for you. Every year? Yeah, maybe for you every three years, just like the PAP. So what are the criteria for determining what test we do? And these are the one, only ones that are really out there that are worth doing. I'll mention one other, 1-hydroxypyrene, which is a metabolite of um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs. Problem is, you breathe some barbecue smoke, you get behind a diesel driving home, cigarette smoke, all these confounding factors, and then you come in and get your 1HP done. It's a urine test, very simple. It's not very expensive. Uh, what does it mean if it's elevated? Does it mean that you got exposed to one of the maybe six or seven PAHs in that 1800 chemicals that we know of, or the 59 COPCs? Or is it because you, you know, got behind the wrong car when you're driving home or driving to work, or did you smoke, or did you, were you around a smoker, or did you barbecue this weekend? on and on it goes. So this 1HP, Karen and I have been talking about it for a long time. Haven't gone in that direction yet, but one of these days I think we might, hope we do. Okay, so I need to get to my mouse here. This is a forum that we created for the workers and anybody else, you guys can go to it. It's on the internet. And this explains to whoever comes to us for a post-exposure evaluation we spent, in fact, Dr. Allgood started this, and then we modified it and added to it. And uh, I took it to the CVST, the Chemical Vapor Solution Team meeting, had them vet it, and this is what we ended up with. So this tells the worker, they get handed this if they have an exposure. They're supposed to get handed this anyway. 
and they take it to the clinic. And when they get to the clinic, they get a paper copy because they get a, a, a laminated one that's given to them. And it tells them exactly what the clinical assessment's going to be about. Not expecting you to read it. Uh, I didn't print them out. I was thinking I was going to, but I think I forgot. Um, and at the bottom we say, note, there are no specific blood or urine tests available for the actual chemicals themselves to which you may have been exposed other than those listed. I didn't put that in big bold type, but I was, we definitely explained that to him. So then I talk about the various tests we do, what they mean, what they don't mean, why we do them, and try to get all that on two pages. Somehow we managed to do it. You can go online. Our website is hanford.gov slash health. Hanford.gov slash health. And you can look this form up. Just, um, just search for chemical exposure evaluation or chemical exposure. It'll pop up. Print it out. You've got copies of this in your emergency room, right? Yeah. I don't know if you have the laminated, but they're supposed to be given to anybody that comes in with an exposure. And that's all I'm going to talk about there. So talk a little bit about, well, I'm not going to talk much about lead. There is lead out there. People get exposed to it, potentially. They're protected from it as much as possible. They're all trained about it. And we have uh, one or two lead programs that people come in and get their, their lead levels done on an annual basis. If there was any, any uh, concern about a possible exposure more than usual, uh, then uh, they would get an evaluation then. Can I talk about the Antwerp Patrol, Karen? <laughs> you think? Probably not. OK. Well, potentially, the Hanford Patrol is exposed to lead. How and why? Oh, yeah. So I'll say no more, but they're, they're, def <laughs> they're definitely in the lead program. Yeah. Mercury, cadmium, beryllium, and hexavalent chromium. Here we go. Uh, old story lead. Everybody knows about lead and lead and gasoline and everything. And, uh, I think I probably lived close to a highway. I struggled through all those years of education. I managed to get through. Now it's, it's a joke, but you know, kids that lived closer to a highway where there was lead and gas had better higher IQ, I mean, lower IQs and did worse in school and had behavioral problems. And the kids at a distance uh, didn't. And it was like a perfect slope. And this is one of the ways, it was a famous study, this is one of the ways they realized that there was lead damage happening to these kids because they were breathing the leaded gasoline fumes. Fumes? Vapors. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this is an old story and, you know, protected. And we want to make sure that kids, uh, old houses with old lead paint and so forth don't get exposed to lead. But the workers out there are in lead programs. The only thing I'm going to say about cadmium, which uh, has a variety of health effects, is that there's probably more in the tobacco smoke that people smoke out there than there is uh, anything they get exposed to there. And I, and I talk to them about that on the rare occasion I get invited to come out and talk about cadmium, cadmium concerns. Uh, that and polonium-210, which are probably two of the major carcinogens that are in tobacco smoke. Polonium-210 and tobacco. I used to live in tobacco area. I refused to grow my tobacco, tobacco allotment and drove my neighbor crazy because he wanted to make money off it. I'll grow it, Doc. And I said, no, <laughs> not going to grow it. That was in the 70s. Uh, mercury, brilliance, and hexavalent chromium. Anecdotes about each of those. Here we go. Mercury. I first came here in 04. Within a, within a year, suddenly we have this big mercury concern. Why? Does anybody, anybody know the Karen Vetterhan story? She was a researcher at Dartmouth. She was working with pure um, dimethylmercury. And the reason she was working with pure dimethylmercury is because it's, a, it's the only way that you can calibrate a, a nuclear magnetic resonance machine. You have to use pure dimethylmercury. She got two drops on the back of a double-gloved hand, and she was dead six months later from mercury poisoning. So the story goes. You can look it up, and you can read the story. She died in 97. About the time that that became you went, went viral, let's say. I, I don't think things went that viral in the early 2000s, but maybe. Uh, about the time it did go viral, or somebody out here heard this story, uh, Savannah Riverside publicized that they had discovered they have not only mercury in their lusts, you know what a lust is? Or an ust. Lust is a leaky underground storage tank, but uh, in their storage tanks. But they, so immediately, the workers out here thought, oh my gosh, we've got mercury. And look what happened to this woman, and we've got to, we're going to have uh, dimethylmercury, and it's going to kill us all. So we had these huge risk communication um, meetings, you know, two, three hundred people at a time, because there were about at that time twelve or fifteen hundred uh, workers at the tank farms, I think. 
and um, that was in 2004 and 5. And from that, Mercury programs, nothing to do with space, but the Mercury programs uh, evolved. So Tank Farm Worker Program and Tank Farm Entry Program. So we had a lot of funny names for these programs, these, these medical monitoring programs. Tank Farm Worker is people that are working in the tank farms all the time. Tank Farm Entry is defined by somebody who's coming in intermittently and I think they have to be in there for, what is it, 30 days of the year or something. A lot of these things are 30 day cut off, but aren't in there all the time, but, but come in there for a variety of reasons. And they get monitored and they get a mercury, blood mercury, you know, urine mercury every year, make sure they haven't been get, gotten exposed to mercury. Uh, as they characterize the tank head spaces and the, the vapors that they pull off from the breather filter from the risers, uh, every well, they're doing this all the time, and in every CVST meeting, they report the results of those things. Uh, there has been almost no mercury and almost no uh, dimethylmercury. And even though there is a permissible exposure limit for dimethylmercury, I'm not sure I would want to breathe dimethylmercury given its high, high, high toxicity. So you can see why the workers are concerned. And right about the time when we thought, well, we've probably done this for long enough, probably about five years ago, all of a sudden there was an episode out there where uh, there was exposure because something broke and people were exposed to vapors. And right at that time, we figured it wasn't a politically uh, correct time to say we're going to take away the mercury program. So the mercury program was ongoing, even though there's almost never any mercury uh, reported from the tank vapor characterizations. So as I say, they do the headspace monitoring and ambient air monitoring results are reported at those meetings, but these ambient air monitoring things, they go out there and they just intermittently evaluate what's going on. It's not 24-7, 365. It's intermittent and, and after an exposure. But you can imagine there's been an exposure, people smell stuff, they get off, they, they call somebody. By the time they get there, it's gone. 99.9% .9 of the time, that's what's happened. They haven't found anything because the wind blows and it's gone. So another one of the technologies they're doing out there is little weather stations, and now they're characterizing the the way the air flows and where the likely exposures might be from the various tanks, and uh, they just reported on that. That's my daughter. Let me just turn that off right now. Usually I say that at the beginning of the meeting, and I don't know where we go if there's a fire, because we, we always say that at the beginning of our trainings. If there's a or shelter in place or what door we go out. Um, all right, so that's, any questions on that? On the mercury thing or tank farms that I've talked to so far? Chromium-6, two technologies, chest x-ray versus uh, low-dose spiral CT, LDCT. Uh, I had uh, welders come up to me after a meeting that we had about Chrome-6 because the, the level, the permissible exposure level, uh, was reduced from 52 micrograms per cubic meter, uh, and it took them 10 years to revise this, down to five micrograms per cubic meter, okay? That's a big drop, in other words, They've been told that they can be exposed to 52 micrograms per cubic liter all these years, and suddenly they say, oops, you know what? We think anything over five is dangerous to your health. So these welders have been working for years under the assumption that it was safe to work if it was below 52, and now it's five. So we had meetings, and one of the, one of the workers came up after the meeting and handed me this printed out article from the internet. It was about a guy named Dr. Stephen Markowitz, who was doing low-dose computer uh, tomography on, uh, on workers in Ohio at the time. He was, he was from New York, but he had this kind of pilot program going. And he was claiming, uh, and, and, and actually truthfully, although at the time I didn't know this, but he was claiming that they were reducing the uh, number of lung cancer deaths from the, from the people that they were screening. And of course, there's negative sides of screening too, you understand, people go to thoracotomy and end up having nothing but a, a little fibrous mass or something. Uh, but at the same time, there was this big study, this longitudinal study that NCI was doing, National Cancer Institute, that came out, and you all remember this because it was just a few, couple, two, three years ago, 20% uh, reduction in deaths from lung cancer if people were screened with this. So the bottom line is now we have this low-dose uh, CT program for former Hanford workers, former Hanford workers here in the area. It's being run by Dr. Welch, Laura Welch, who, uh, and, and you have to be a high risk tobacco user and maybe other high risk, uh, maybe, I'm not sure if welders per se, or maybe you have to, welders and smokers or something like that, but you have, have to be deemed high risk to be in the program. And uh, I listened to the results, I was in DC a couple months ago, and a couple of the people that were heading up the program were talking about their results, and they, had, they have had false negatives where people have gone in and, and have had 
lung biopsies or even thoracotomy with uh, removal of a section of the lung. But they've also saved not only a number of people from probably uh, death from, uh, from lung cancer, but they also found a couple of esophageal cancers and a couple of other things in these low-dose scans and saved the two that they reported. They saved both those people's lives, which is kind of interesting. So it has sort of a fringe benefit. So that's ongoing right now, a former worker program. Uh, only former workers, not, not active present day workers though, are eligible. So here's why I'm here. Uh, Brillium disease, and I'm gonna hand out these things. Brillium disease is, I'm not gonna say it's unique to the Department of Energy sites, but it, it's almost like that. I think it's gonna be, see the bottom line, I think it might be the legacy medical issue, uh, meaning fairly, fairly unique and one that, um, that has occurred primarily where beryllium has been used for one reason or another, and beryllium was used after the B reactor. The B reactor, they didn't use beryllium, but they used it primarily for cladding the uranium that they bombarded with neutron, neutrons to form plutonium and other things too. And of course, these workers brazed it and they polished it and they sanded it and they did all these things with it and were potentially exposed to beryllium dust and or beryllium oxide, which looks like the two major sensitizers for beryllium. And then left that dust behind, so then the cleanup workers came in, and before they had a really active brilliant program, which didn't happen until the late 90s, uh, people were potentially exposed to brilliant dust and brilliant oxide uh, as they were cleaning up until that program got into effect. And that program was called the Chronic Brilliant Disease Prevention Program, CBDPP. A friend of mine, Dr. Tim Takaro, if anybody, if you, if you happen to know him, who's now up at the Vancouver at the Simon Fraser University, He's the one that really pushed for this program, and I just was reading a paper of his the other day from 97, uh, pretty interesting stuff. And so this program developed where people who were, are known to be, or thought to be exposed to beryllium, get into one of the programs. We have the beryllium worker program, and this is for people who know they are working around beryllium sites, where there's beryllium in a building or beryllium in an area of a building. And on an annual basis, they come in and they get evaluated to see if they have become sensitized. BES is beryllium sensitization. Always shorthand, right? CBD is chronic beryllium disease. Chronic beryllium disease, I say, is sarcoidosis with a positive BELPT. So if you have patients with sarcoidosis who have ever worked anywhere where they might have been exposed to beryllium, they should have a BELPT done. It's not a very expensive test. On the outside, we, send, we do them through uh, four, potentially four different laboratories in the country that do them and are trustable, and well, two now, but well, okay, three. But we used to, it used to be four. Now it's, now it's primarily two. And most people that get evaluated go down to National Jewish Health in Denver and get evaluated if they're sensitized. If they're sensitized, they go down there to find out if they have CBD, chronic beryllium disease. So it's like sarcoidosis. Sar uh, granulomas scattered or consolidated through the lung fields, uh, diminution of, of pulmonary function, reduced DLCO, you know, diffusion of, of uh, carbon monoxide, all these things, that's how they evaluate them when they go down there, and then they do bronchoscopy with biopsies, and uh, they, they put some uh, saline down there and suck back up the fluid and, and check it for BELPT, because some people will develop signs and symptoms of chronic beryllium disease, have a negative BELPT blood test, and are known to have worked around beryllium, and so the presumption is it's beryllium until proven otherwise, so they go down there and they go through all this stuff, and uh, and there's, there's compensation programs. So if you're diagnosed with CBD from the workers' compensation program, you immediately get a check for $150,000 and then medical care for the CBD for the rest of your life. So it's not, it's not, without, its, not without its benefits to get tested and evaluated to see if, if one has CBD. So anybody that's worked around Brilliant, any, any job site, particularly in the DOE complex, uh, ever, and they've been diagnosed with sarcoidosis or have something that's like sarcoidosis, chronic obstructive, obstructive pulmonary disease, and they're not smokers or have other reasons for it, or even, even if they are, they should have a BLPT done at some point. And the trifold that I gave you is something that we pass around the site, and uh, it, it's designed to inform people about beryllium disease, and the little card is something that the beryllium awareness group, the BAG, lovingly known as, which used to meet twice a month and uh, had one closed meeting for people that have beryllium or the beryllium affected and one open meeting for everybody that wanted to come and some of the beryllium affected workers would be there too. Long discussions largely about compensation and the, and the difficulties of getting compensation and the difficulties of going through the travel down to get evaluated and, and you know it's scary to people 
but uh, you know the program is all covered, so the workers don't have to pay anything. Sometimes they have to pay ahead and they get reimbursed. But they go down, and they get evaluated, and they can even take somebody with them to chaperone to help them, because you know after you have a have a bronchoscopy and it's a like a two-day, one-night process, uh, it's nice to have a family member or somebody be there with you. So that's all covered. So the Brilliant Awareness Group uh, stopped meeting publicly. They have their closed meetings now, and I'm urging them to reopen their public meetings so that we can start communicating again. Because through the process of the Brilliant Corrective Action Plan, which came about from a, an evaluation of the chronic Brilliant Disease Prevention Program uh, five years ago, as it was evaluated and determined that there were a lot of gaps, a lot of things that needed to be straightened out across the, across the site, uh, then the Corrective Action Plan just as just closing now, just finishing up, uh, tightening up the cr chronic brilliant disease, the CBDPP, so that people are protected even better than they were five years ago. It took them five years of meetings. And Karen, you looked a lot, lot younger five years ago. <laughs> Karen went to all of them. And it was, it was challenging, because you have 40 or 50 people in a room, they all have different worldviews, perceptions about how these, how these rules and regs should, should be uh, put together. So I, I think CBD is going to be a legacy medical issue because you don't hear about beryllium disease any many other places other than uh, one or two production facilities where they actually produce beryllium copper alloys and things like that. Beryllium is in everything. There's beryllium in this room. Light switches in your cell phone, uh, bicycle frames, uh, golf clubs, all those things. Uh, anything that has to do with the nuclear industry, aerospace industry, industry, aeronautical industry. But you know it's all tidied up and, and not you're not exposed to it. So I tell people, well, don't go mess around with your bicycle frame or your golf club. Don't polish it or braze it or mess around with it unless you're respiratorily protected. And even dermal sensitization can occur. If you get sensitized dermally and then get some beryllium in your lungs, you can develop uh, beryllium disease. So, questions about that? Please. Yeah, good point. Yeah, if they're not so if they're not still there at, at Hanford, then uh, they do have that. In fact, you see that there's a TV commercial that talks about that that I see from time to time. If you were a, a Hanford worker and you you know call this number. Uh, okay, so that's so then we have biological has has a charismatic megafauna, which I always like talking about when I talk uh, environmental science and biology at Bellevue yeah. College. Charismatic megafauna. What are those? Those are like lions and tigers and bears. Yeah, well, elk out there is probably the, probably the most dangerous. Why? Do they attack? No, because they run across the highway, and uh, they have these signs out there that warn you about elk crossing and so forth. So charis charismatic megafauna are concerns pigeons and other poopers, uh, and a bunch of dead birds a couple of years ago I was called out to talk about and, and respond to, and they were worried about all these birds that had somehow died in this area, and it was, it was sort of between a building and a, and a hard place. And um, these birds had died, and they were worried that they were going to get exposed to something from the dead birds. So I called up an old girlfriend who uh, is one of the world's renowned ornithologists and, and veterinarians in New York City. And she said, no, I don't think so. There's nothing except the poop itself. You know, you have to worry about the, the feces because it could have histoplasmosis or yada, yada, yada. So I just told these guys just to make sure they wore respiratory protection gloves and go clean it up. I guess they did. <laughs> Oh, and then it's slippery. It's very slippery. So people were slipping and sliding on it on some of the uh, uh, walkways around the WTP a few years back. I don't know if anybody was ever injured, but I remember that was a concern. We get these reports every day about things that are near misses, and that was one maybe four years ago. I don't know. And then just like everybody else in this room, uh, people get the flu. We have a good, very strong flu program out there. We vaccinate, I don't know, five or 6,000 people every year. West Nile virus, we've had a couple of people claim that they got bitten by a mosquito out there and got West Nile, at least one that was publicized. Hantavirus, which is in what animal? Specifically in Washington State? Deer mice. Cute little things. Pink feet, white belly, pink ears. Seen one uh, in my house. 
And in Washington State, one out of every seven carries hantavirus. Hantavirus is 30 to 50 percent uh, more lethal if you contract it. How do you not contract it? I go through this. I get called out there, and, and the maintenance people or the janitorial staff get worried about it because they've found signs of mice, you know, feces, and and so forth. And so masks, N95 preferably, gloves, hypochlorite, Clorox solution, wet it down, cover it, wait a half an hour, come back and gently put it in two bags, double bag it, and just throw it in the regular trash after that. But um, they are concerned about it, and I have gotten called out to talk about it. Norovirus, you know, we had a little epidemic a year or two ago with one of the contractors had a picnic and uh, a lot of people got norovirus and I'm not going to say where it came from, but we know who provided the pizza and the salad. You may, you may, all, you may all know about it. I don't know. Uh, here's the number one thing I get called for out on site to calm down, the, calm down the workers or quell their anxiety is MRSA. Why is that? These are guys that work around rad and chemicals and heavy equipment and so forth and they're worried about MRSA. Because it's something you can't see. Nobody, know, you know, all they read in the paper is somebody died of a MRSA pneumonia or something, like that kid in WWU that died a few years back that didn't go to the hospital, didn't go to the hospital, and you know, had flu pneumonia and then somehow got MRSA on top of it and died at 21, 22 years old. And so people read stories like that, and as soon as one of their coworkers comes back after being treated for MRSA, and we had one guy come back and show off his scabs and his, you know, his IV lock that he had running. And, uh, you know, he's already been deemed okay, non-contagious, and go back to work. But as soon as he gets out there and starts doing that, then everybody goes crazy. So I've given more talks and listened to their concerns about MRSA than anything else. Legionella. Legionella because uh, there's some coolers out there, cooling towers, and somebody looked it up online and, and realized that it hadn't been properly uh, deconned uh, and uh, the water, and so they wanted it tested for Legionella. Uh, pertussis epidemic, and I'm, I'm not going to go too much into this and into talks from denitrifying bacteria, but it's a process they use out there, and somebody was concerned because he read it on, online that they might get exposed to endotoxin, which can cause an allergic reaction or aggravate asthma, but it's not the same as having endotoxin uh, that's been produced in your body from an infection that you got going on there and going to toxic shock. So I'm going to zap forward here and talk about this, RAD. Pass these out. So Karen and I, Dr. Phillips and I, were talking yesterday about um, what do you need to know about radiation exposure, and I think we decided the most important thing to know is that there are sort of two types of exposure that we're concerned with. One is uh, external irradiation, just like they do with foods, and that's the source is over there somewhere, and you get exposed to it from there, like gamma rays. Okay, and depending on your time that you're exposed, the distance from the source, and the shielding that you have at the time, you get a dose from that. And it can be calculated pretty easily. If you know how long you were there, you know how far you were from the source, you know what was between you and the source, then you can calculate a do dose. The other type of exposure is contamination. And this would be an event where something blows up, releases, and this is your dirty bomb scenario, releases a variety of radionuclides and releases a dust that has these radionuclides in it and you get contaminated by that dust. You may inhale it through your nose, you may get it in your ears, it may be in your hair, maybe on your clothes, maybe on your skin. So external irradiation coming from a source at a distance, gamma rays primarily, and neutrons too, or contamination you're contaminated by dust that contains nuclides that can get into your body and cause damage that way over the long run. Now, just to avoid any argument here, you could have external contamination on your body and be, an ir be irradiated from gamma-producing radionuclides that are in that contamination. And then also, when, you, when and if you absorb it, either through a skin uh, abrasion or you get stuck by something, uh, or you inhale it or you ingest it, then that stuff will go through your body and will forever, it'll land somewhere, end up in the bones, end up in the teeth, end up in your liver, end up in any part of your body, uh, uh, your thyroid, and will forever irradiate you as long as the half-life is ongoing, half-life being the number of minutes, seconds, years, during which half of the radioactivity of that given substance goes away. So, for instance, for iodine-131, which will go to your thyroid gland, 
eight day half life. So usually we think at the end of about 10 half lives, it's gone. So 80 days later, I-131 is gone. But meanwhile, it's irradiated your thyroid gland. So we have SSKI, saturated solution of potassium iodide, to give to somebody if they've been exposed to I-131, got into their system, and you're worried about it going to the thyroid, so you give them saturated solution of potassium iodide, so your, your thyroid takes up all that normal iodine, and there's no room for the radioactive iodine to latch onto, and you just pee it out, primarily. So there, there's a whole gamut of ways of treating radiation exposure, and I'm going to allude to, the, allude to them, but on your handout, if you have a smartphone, uh, if you want to click on that uh, little, uh, what do they call these things? URL. Well, it's got a fancy name for the little square uh, symbols that you can click on with a, with a laser. What is it? QR, QR, yeah, QR symbol, that's it. Uh, I just call them funny little squares that you can uh, click on. That'll take you right to a site, and you can download the uh, Radiation Emergency Medical Management app, which I'll quickly show you. Or maybe I won't. Anyway, you can download the app, and you can click on anything in there that tells you how to take care of the, the radiologic emergency that you're facing. Uh, but, okay, so everything, everything that makes light, sound, heat, microwave, etc., those are all radiation, but the ionizing radiation, uh, the way that causes damage is the uh, radiation itself, the electrons, can remove electrons from the orbit of an atom resulting in charged ionized particles. And these ionized particles, these ionized chemicals that are part of your cellular makeup can then cause damage to anywhere in the cell, but the most important part of the cell that we worry about is the DNA because it can make it run awry, become cancer later on, or it can kill the cell or kill all the cells depending on the dose of uh, radiation that you're exposed to. So that's why it's called ionizing radiation because it ionizes, you know, I say think water, breaks it into hydrogen ion and, and hydroxyl, and, um, and it can cause damage to cellular components, which is what I say right there, and most importantly, DNA. So external waves, x-rays, gamma rays, so forth. you know, if somebody gets a chest x-ray, they're not, they're not radioactive, right? If you radiate food, the food is not ra radioactive. That's e external uh, exposure, best to call it irradiation. And then the contamination is where you get the uh, material on your skin. I'm not going to belabor that. So external contamination, which can be external on your skin or internal in your body. So the external contamination is radionuclides on the clothing, skin, hair, etc. And you can get it in your body this way. And then, you, you, you know, you have a radiation, um, you should have a radiation uh, officer here, and you have people that are in nuclear medicine and other uh, radiation areas that can advise you. And then, of course, if it happened up on site, uh, we would have the uh, health physics technicians and so forth determine dosages and scan people and, and so forth. But if somebody's contaminated, the most important thing there is you have to isolate them and you have to decontaminate them. That means get their clothes off, shower them down do nasal swabs uh, and, uh, and so forth and start getting your white counts and urine tests and the th thing you want to notice is what, ha what time they get exposed and when is the first time they start vomiting if they get exposed to something uh, like a gamma exposure, external source radiation. Because the time to vomiting, assuming it's not psychological vomiting, will give you a fairly good indication of what the dose was. So if they start vomiting an hour after they got exposed, they probably got 500 rads or something like that. If they don't vomit for six hours, then they got a lot less. If they vomit in 45 minutes or 30 minutes, they probably got, you know, six, 700 rads, which is in the lethal area, so lethal range. So isolate them, decon them, read the literature that I just passed out to you, and then go to that site. There's, there is the site, I think this is probably one of the best, REM. NLM, National Library of Medicine .gov. That's on your that's on your handout. So, and uh, when somebody when somebody has been exposed and is is, de is contaminated, then I say it's kind of like Ebola. All the rules and regs are the same thing: controlled area, prevent tracking, restrict access, restrict access, monitor people, strict isolation, buffer zone, controlling waste, ventilation, changing instruments, using waterproof. It very very much sounds like Ebola. Containment or you know prevention, 
So uh, contaminated, radiation contaminated individual needs to be treated pretty much like that. And this comes right out of that site that I just referred you to, so. Uh, there's about five pages of, if it's this radionuclide, then treat with this and what the uh, potential hazards are. And I put this up just as a joke, natural remedies for radiation exposure. If you want to recommend leafy green, green vegetables, peppermint leaf and chickweed, then go right ahead. But uh, I'm not sure if that's been put through a peer reviewed uh, evaluation. Again, that's our, that's our website, hanford.gov slash health. Feel free to go there and you can look at that exposure, chemical exposure evaluation sheet. Uh, time is up a few minutes after, eight after or thereabouts. If you have questions, I'll be glad to field them. If you have to leave, go ahead. I won't be, my feelings won't be hurt. <coughs> No, this, they, they test it all the time and there's no rat in them. Well, no, well, just the count of 1,800 chemicals that could be involved. Do you need to for that? Even oh, that might be a you know, that's a good question because that, that was brought up recently and somebody was saying, I wonder if they or we should be doing that. And usually the contamination is more, I smelled something, I felt something and got out of it and that was it. Uh, but I, I know there are people that have immediately wanted to or, or gone and showered and, and you know, changed their clothes. But it's not, it's not really part of the protocol. It's not our protocol, and I don't think it's the contractor's protocol either, so. Usually not, but they certainly, I know they're out in something that they're showering for. Yeah, yeah. Personal choice, but good question. Maybe not a good answer, but a good question. Yeah. Two-part question. How long have you been tracking chronic beryllium disease, and how many cases have you had just outside in, in this area? Yeah. Because that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, well, the workers, I mean, the only ones that we follow are the people that have come through our program since 1999-ish around there. Um, we have, tra I'm not just going to round off the numbers, but we know people that have come through that program, about 150 have been known to be sensitized, okay? And then an, an, another, about 40 probably are sensitized too, but we, we don't put them in the sensitized group, so you know, 190 total, but a, another 40 who have de developed CBD, who've gone down, been evaluated, have CBD, uh, and are uh, you know, ongoingly evaluated for it and, and treated for it. But, you know, I'm talking all the time to the people that I go to those meetings with and I say, most of you guys, you don't cough as much as I do. I mean, I've said that at meetings because we were talking about how bad is this disease. And, um, but on the other hand, we know several people, at least one of whom has been on the press, the radio, TV, videos and so forth, Tom Peterson, who's got O2 cannula running all the time, tank, and the whole works and a couple others that I know of personally who have pretty serious disease and certainly people have died from and with it but uh, the numbers are being kept in a brilliant registry which is at the uh, maintained by Oak Ridge in Tennessee and at some point they're going to take all that data and analyze it but I could I can't tell you what the case fatality rate is I, I don't know any personal cases that have died from it maybe with it but not from it and even those I don't know Yeah, no, nobody's doing studies on the general public. The only studies that have been done, because it is kind of a rare disease, the only studies that have been done are public around one of the facilities. Um, uh, Brush Wellman, which is now called Materia on Brush. I almost forget it. I still want to call it Brush Wellman. And they did find some people there. And we, we know of cases where people carried the dust home and, and their partners or household members have gotten sensitized. And I don't know if they developed uh, brilliant disease. There have been other folks who have been sensitized by other things too, like dental um, uh, bridges and, and so forth, which have really in them. So, yeah. But it's primarily a, it's definitely industrial exposure, definitely an occupational medical uh, situation, and mostly Department of Energy sites. So Rocky Flats, the former site, Rocky Flats. SRS, you know, they all have their cases of rheumatoid disease. I think S I think Rocky Flats has the highest. Like maybe we have the second highest number. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>